we saw that coffee farmers were not being engaged because every time you're going to trap gorillas, you cross coffee farms. And we found that they were not getting a fair price for their coffee. And not all of them were benefiting from the tourism industry because not everybody can be a ranger or a porter or sell their crafts or accommodation or food. And so we thought that why not create a global brand that can save gorillas one step at a time by empowering these very farmers who, if they get a good price for their coffee, they won't have to enter the park to poach. This episode is brought to you in part by Handlebar Coffee. For almost 10 years, Handlebar Coffee Roasters have been supplying Santa Barbara with artisan, handcrafted specialty coffee from around the world. Spearheaded by two ex-professional cyclists who've traveled around the world on two wheels, they settled in sunny Santa Barbara to provide the community with two cafes that bring quality and hospitality to locals and visitors afar. Visit their website at handlebarcoffee.com and use promo code GLADIS20 for a one-time 20% discount when you sign up for an addiction subscription. This episode is brought to you in part by our sponsor, Tidal Influence, a Californian ecological consulting firm who proudly supports environmental education and all of the diverse conservation efforts that Pelicanus works to highlight. Visit their website at tidalinfluence.com to learn more about what they do to conserve our coastal resources and how you can get involved. Hello everyone, and welcome to our first Pelicanus Conservation Conversations video episode. I am your host, co-founder and president of Pelicanus, Austin Parker. Now, Pelicanus is an organization that is focused on the movement that is and has been happening in the conservation field. We publish two podcasts. One is a long-form documentary-style show that highlights the people and organizations that are making it their purpose to grow the conservation field and to show how people have and still are making monumental differences in our world with intentional change. Now the second is a twice monthly short form podcast that highlights the recent news stories that exemplify this exact type of change. Now we aim to show that not only is there something that can be done, it is being done by dedicated scientists and organizations who have made conservation and protecting biodiversity their purpose and we can find optimism through science. But all of our episodes will still be available in audio format on our website at pelicanus.org, as well as SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Podcasts. But now we're super excited to be breaking into the world of YouTube. Along with our debut video episode, we are excited to announce that we are officially a nonprofit organization. This is just the beginning. We have a lot of big things planned, so please, like and subscribe our page to follow along with us on this journey. To celebrate new beginnings, we have a really special person and story to share with you. Our conversation today is with Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka. She is a wildlife veterinarian and founder and CEO of Conservation Through Public Health, as well as Gorilla Conservation Coffee, two organizations that are focused on mountain gorilla conservation through community health and development operating throughout the country of Uganda. Now she has an amazing story and has already had so much success in protecting the mountain gorillas of Uganda while also helping local communities with alternative livelihoods and public health efforts. Thank you again for watching. Let's get straight to our conversation with Dr. Gladys. So I'm Dr. Gladys Kalemazik Soka, founder and chief executive officer of conservation through public health which is a grassroots NGO and nonprofit that we founded in 2003 because I was concerned about diseases being transmitted between people and gorillas. We had um, a fatal skin disease outbreak in the critically endangered mountain gorillas. At that time, there were only about 650 remaining in the world, which was eventually traced to people living around the national park who have very little health care. And the gorillas got it when they went into people's gardens to eat their banana plants. And they found dirty clothing that they put out on scarecrows. And they put this out to scare away gorillas, baboons, and other wildlife. And gorillas are very curious, just like humans. And they must have touched the clothing and then groomed each other. And the mites spread through the group. So all the gorillas got affected, but the baby gorilla was the worst affected and died, unfortunately. And we treated the rest with ivermectin, and they got better. And then around that time, we started to ask ourselves, how did they get this disease? Because 
when the tourists were visiting, the tourists are normally, you know, very clean and hygienic because they're not poor people. It costs quite a lot to visit the gorillas. And the porters who carry the tourist luggage don't get to the gorillas. At least they never used to at that time. And so we started to look around and found that it actually came from the people. And when you visit their gardens, they haven't covered their rubbish heaps and all of that. And so although I was hired as the first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority, because they were concerned about diseases like a fatal flu or something like that coming from tourists who are coming to visit the gorillas and making them all sick, um, they hired me to, in order to prevent such diseases and to attend to them in time. And yet the first disease which actually came to the gorillas in Windy was from the local community who they share a habitat with. So yeah, it was interesting. And I was hired, you know, like when I look at COVID-19 right now, I think of the reason why I was hired is they were worried about something like that coming to affect the wildlife, especially the great apes which are closely related to. And tourism was started because the area where the gorillas is is very, very tiny. It's only 330 square kilometers. And if they were not providing anything for the community or any economic incentive, any economic reason to keep them alive, the people just keep cutting the forest. So it became a national park. It used to be a forest reserve where people could go in and cut trees and go in as much as they want. And it was turned into a national park in 1992 in order to protect the gorillas and other wildlife in the forest. And one way that was thought about protecting them was enabling tourists to come and see them and they pay money which can help to conserve the gorillas in the forest and right now the money from gorilla tourism has been so much that it's even gone to other national parks that don't have any tourists so so yeah no that that's part of the reason i was hired but i got into it because let me see i like animals i grew up with many pets at home and i also started up a wildlife club in a school that i was at in primary school, in secondary school. And I took the children to the national park. And by the end of it, I felt like I wanted to be a vet who works with wildlife. And so over time, I got to study the chimpanzees in the zoo, the chimpanzees in the wild, the Dongo forest, and then the gorillas in Bwindi. And by the end of it, I felt like I wanted to be a full-time wildlife vet. So I ended up becoming the first full-time wildlife vet for the Uganda. Yeah. <laughs> If you're the first wildlife vet in Uganda, how, where do you go to school for that? <laughs> <laughs> I went to, I first went to um, Royal Veterinary College, University of London, and I learned about all species. Their main focus was domestic species, but they allowed me to work with an animal of my choice. So there's a little bit of flexibility in the program, and I was able to come back home and work with the chimpanzees, and the gorillas, and I also worked in zoos in the UK, like London Zoo, and Tricos Zoo, and Longlit Safari Park, and Whipsnade. So I got experience on the job, and at the end of it, I thought, I want to come back home. So when I started working as the first full-time wildlife vet, I was learning a lot on the job. It was a very, very steep learning curve. But I was learning from other vets around me, like the vets in Kenya Wildlife Service, who they had about, I think, six vets at the time. And they used to come and help or I'd go there and learn about, let's say, how to move elephants, how to dart animals, all that stuff. I'd learn from the Kenyan vets. I'd learn from the vets in Zimbabwe, the vets in South Africa. So I was just basically learning from vets around me, you know, including a vet at the university in Uganda who was sometimes did some work with wildlife. So I was just learning from everyone else. And that's how I learned. I kind of taught myself the first four years. And then I came to America, I went to America and did a zoo medicine residency at North Carolina State University and North Carolina Zoo. They offered it to me because they were, I guess, so impressed by seeing how much I'd done with, you know, I was, I was fairly young vet who had just been on out for a couple of years. So they wanted to see how to give back. And they thought, you know, why not offer you the residency so you can go back home and do even more things. And so then I really learned a lot of clinical work research, publishing, presenting. And while I was there, we decided to set up the non-profit. I also went to Duke University and did a certificate in non-profit management. Then we came back and set up the non-profit with Lawrence, my husband, you just met. 
And Stephen, who's a vet technician, was working with the Ministry of Agriculture. So that's how we started. Like I learned how to, I was able to learn how to manage nonprofits from the classes I got at Duke, which were really good. And yeah, we started in a humble way. Lawrence was one of the first donors with $100. We could open up a bank account. <laughs> and then the North Carolina Zoo actually was our first institutional donor. They gave us a donation of $6,000. And we used it to hold a workshop with all the various stakeholders and people we thought would work with, who I knew, actually, all of them I knew from my work. And they were fantastic. And they gave lots of ideas of, what we sh of how they think we should do what we want to do. Because we had a general mission and vision to prevent disease between people and wildlife and make communities buy into conservation. And so then they thought, OK, this is other ways that you could do it. And yeah, and our, our parents helped out a lot with giving a donations at the beginning. So it's been a journey, <laughs> an entrepreneurial journey. But actually, it's been an interesting journey. I mean, there have been lots of ups and downs but but at the end of the day if you feel like you're making a difference then you feel happier and i'm really pleased that we're seeing progress we're seeing progress some things have been very hard but at least we're seeing some progress the gorilla numbers are going up and people care about them more which is very important and i feel that people's welfare or livelihoods are also improving their health care and livelihoods so that's also good that's great news uh <laughs> So <laughs> b before we get into, you know, more detail about the gorillas in your organization, um, what are you from the area where you guys are living now? Uh, and where, I guess, where are you guys exactly located? I saw on the website, there's different areas that you guys work remotely. Um, but where exactly are you located? And are you from there? Did you move there for this reason? Actually, I grew up in the capital city of Kampala. <laughs> um, you know, of Uganda, which is Kampala. I grew up here in the capital city and I only started going to the national parks because of my job. So, and I, and I love it. I love going out and being with nature and my friends who I grew up with were like, oh, you lead a really interesting life, but I think I'm a bit crazy going out to the wild, but I actually like it. But I didn't grow up in the wild. I grew up in an urban center in the middle of, you know, in the country. And then I eventually I, I found my way, you know, with all the work that we're doing with wildlife, I found myself um, spending more and more time in the wild and I'm really enjoying it. I actually like the contrast. So right now when we're, where we're speaking, we're in Entebbe, which is where the headquarters of CTPH is. And, but I didn't come from Bwindi. Bwindi is like a 10 hour drive from where we are. It's a different part of Uganda. The, the language is, the dialect is different from ours. It's completely different. It's kind of really different. It's like at the border with Uganda and Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's not where I, I grew up and where I came from, but it's become my second home. Because for the past 25 years, I've been going to Bwindi. And it's now become my second home. I spend a lot of time there. Almost as much time there as I do in Kampala and in Tebe, where I grew up as a child. <laughs> we could go a lot of different directions now but i'm i'm thinking we just kind of let's start with just the the species uh, itself the, the gorillas why why gorillas why other than what you mentioned uh, about the, the health issue what is it that uh, you find most interesting and what is it that got you to uh want to focus your life <laughs> on them um, I think it happened gradually, but I've always liked, um, being fascinated by primates, I would say. And as a child, we actually, we never had a, any pet primates, but the next door neighbor had a, a pet monkey that used to come to our house all the time, the Cuban ambassador to Uganda. And that monkey was very naughty. It used to pull the cats and dogs tails. It used to steal bananas in the kitchen. One time I was playing the piano and it also played the notes. And I just thought, this is just amazing. He was called Poncho, very naughty monkey. And then I just, I really got into primates. And then when we started the wildlife club, someone told me that these mountain gorillas, but they're very endangered and they're only found in a certain part of Uganda. And I really wanted to see them, but they said I couldn't because they're not habituated. Then I kind of forgot about it. And then I started vet college and 
when I was at vet school, somebody came to give a talk and they talked about how they're working with the mountain gorillas in Rwanda. And then I sparked up my interest again and I thought, wow, this is, this is a species that I'd love to see and work with. And I couldn't because that time they were only habituated in Rwanda. But then later on, they became habituated in Uganda and I was able to come and that's where I did my research. And that's how I got into them. But part of the reason I also felt gorillas were important to work with is because there's so few in number. That time there were only 650 individuals left in the whole world. And now they're over, just over 1,000, so it's almost doubled, which is great. But there were so few, I thought they were so endangered, so critically endangered, and really needed to do something in order not to lose them. And that was another reason why I thought I should work with them. And also they're extremely intelligent. I've learned so much working with gorillas. Um, they're just amazing and fascinating and very accommodating and gentle giants. So yeah, for all those reasons, I really feel that they should be protected. And another reason I feel they should be protected is they're bringing in so much revenue for the country. Actually tourism in Uganda kind of came to a halt when President Idi Amin came into power and so many animals were killed, poached, that Uganda used to be the part of Africa and then no one used to come to Uganda for tourism. But then when mountain gorillas were discovered in Uganda in the late 80s and then they were habituated in the early 90s, tour it brought back tourism to Uganda. So even when people come to see gorillas, they come and see all the other animals whose numbers are also coming up. So the gorillas basically brought Uganda tourists back to Uganda. So they're so important for the economy as well. On top of being you know, so endangered, so few in number, so being so similar to us, you know, um, they're also very important for economic reasons for the country. And they lifted people out of poverty because it's a donation from every permit goes to the local community and for the park entry fee. So the local community is developing and the wildlife authority has come back to life because of the mountain gorillas. Because it used to just be a government department with no funding. It's so difficult to protect the wildlife. Then when mountain gorilla tourism came along, you know, after a, a few years, the organization is doing really, really well because of the mountain gorillas. So we still feel it's very important to work with them. Um, yeah, I guess I fell in love with the place when I went to Brindy first time around as a vet student and I've never left. <laughs> with the influx of tourism and uh, the, the economic uh, uh, input that that co that comes from that it was able you're able to help the community but also help the the gorillas themselves but you're also seeing a uh, uh, impact a positive impact on other wildlife and habitat areas is it more of just like hey we're saving this area for the gorillas so we can have people come look at them and that's the the benefit yes gorillas are also providing a very big benefit for the other wildlife because actually in windy forest itself you have elephants, you have chimpanzees, you have uh, amazing bird life, you have many other, other species of monkeys, um, like the loose monkey, the, the blue monkey. And so just by protecting the gorillas, you're also protecting the forest. It's a very important water catchment area so people can get water and rain. And if you protect a charismatic species like the mountain gorilla, you have to protect its habitat and you have to protect everything else in its habitat. So that's also really important. But then also the money from gorilla tourism funds 60% of the budget for the government agency that manages wildlife in the country. And some of it goes to fund other protected areas that don't have charismatic species like gorillas or they used to have them long time ago, but now hardly anyone goes. They don't have roads, infrastructure. They have very little tourists coming and that they're not able to support their operational costs. So the money from Windy goes to support all the other parks that don't make money. So it's very, very important for just the wildlife, wildlife, local wildlife economy in general. And on top of that, some of it goes to support the local communities where the gorillas are found, and that makes them more tolerant of the gorillas and other wildlife. I mean, if a gorilla goes to their garden, they're less likely to kill it because they know that it's this gorilla that's lifted us out of poverty. And right now during COVID-19, they're feeling, they're really missing the tourists who came to see the gorillas and really transformed their lives because there's no tourism at the moment. So they're really feeling the pinch. 
and they're appreciating the gorillas even more. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's a silver lining. And that was going to be one of my questions. And I guess we could uh, go into it now is how has COVID uh, affected that? And I guess first, can the, the gorillas can catch COVID, right? Yes, the gorillas can catch COVID from people because we are so closely related. We can make each other sick. We share over 98% genetic material and gorillas have ever caught other respiratory diseases from people. Um, and so we know that COVID, which spreads in the same way, can also likely spread to them. And also the protein receptors on people are exactly the same as gorillas. The protein receptors that the virus likes to attach to, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, the ACE2 protein receptors in people are the same as gorillas, chimpanzees, and uh, some other old world primates. So that means that it will affect gorillas in the same way that it affects people. So we are very, very concerned that they can catch COVID from us. Before we get into uh, you know more detail about the economics and uh, and how you know community health, I, I think we should maybe just kind of more talk about the species itself. Uh, can you tell us more about the, the mountain gorilla? Um, where what's their species range? What do they eat? How do they interact with the ecosystem? You know those kinds of things. Yeah, so mountain gorilla is um, one of amongst the great apes. So humans, is, humans are the great ape that everybody is most familiar with. But we also have gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans. Um, and in fact, among the chimpanzees, there's pygmy chimps called bonobos. So all of those are the great apes. And gorillas are, you know, very similar to us. Gorillas tend to be, um, they live in a harem. So they tend to have like, mountain gorillas especially have like, one dominant male and many females. There may be other older males that join the group, but there's only one dominant male. He's the one who normally mates with the females. And they normally move in a group, like in a harem. But females can transfer from one group to another, and males can transfer from one group to another when they come of age, and they know that they can't mate anymore. You know, they can't, they'll never have a chance to mate because they're not dominant. So it's mainly the females who transfer because they can't, you know, a daughter can't mate with the father, so they'll transfer to another group. And gorillas give babies, give birth to babies once every four years, which doesn't help them much because they have a very slow reproductive rate compared to humans. So that means that the human population growth is much higher than the gorilla population growth. And that means that the gorillas are more compromised, their habitat is more destroyed because they have less space. And so that's one big thing. Gorillas eat, a lot, they like eating leaf shoots and stems, but in certain areas where the altitude is a bit lower, they will eat more fruit. They'll spend more time in the trees and eat fruit. But they tend to eat, if they go to a banana plant, they're more interested in the stem rather than the fruit, which is really annoying for the people because they destroy the whole plant, <laughs> you know? So they like eating leaf shoots and stems. They prefer secondary growth to the main primary forest. And a silverback gorilla can eat you know, as much as 15 kilos a day of just roughage, you know, and just like, you know, relief shoots and stems. So yeah, that's, that's how they are. And they are, yeah, they're gentle giants. King Kong gives them a bad name, you know, but they're actually very gentle giants and they don't really harm anyone, anybody, unless they're really, they feel that their lives are in danger and they're being threatened that's the only time they'll attack. But generally, gorillas would rather not attack. They're very, very gentle. They're very accommodating. They'd rather avoid people or welcome them. You know, they, they can be very accommodating. So that's, they have a very great temperament. A lot of people say chimps is what we are and gorillas is what we want to be. <laughs> so they're like gentle Buddhas, very accommodating and... The moms really look after their babies. They stay, they share, they, do, they share a nest with their baby until the baby is about four years old when they have the new one. And then they always have one, a new one when one can make its own nest. The dads sometimes look after the babies um, if the mother disappears or something happens to the mother. We've seen all kinds of interesting behaviors in the gorillas, which we can learn from or things to them that are so similar to us. So it's, it's been really, it's very fascinating. I mean, I've visited them hundreds of times because of my work. 
that every single visit I learn something new. So you, you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, what are the, I don't know, top three or five main conservation issues when it comes to the mountain gorilla? Um, and, what, and we can transition that into uh, what CTPH uh, and, you know, your, your uh, coffee and your cafe uh, are, are helping to do about it. The top three conservation issues when it comes to gorillas, I would say is the biggest one is habitat loss. So the mountain gorilla is the, one of the fewest in subspe gorilla subspecies in number, but it's the only one that's showing a positive growth trend. But across Africa, you have among the eastern gorillas is a mountain gorilla and is the eastern lowland gorilla or, or the Guarulhos gorilla. And that's found only in Democratic Republic of Congo. Their numbers are going down a lot because of habitat loss. And people, there's not much tourism there, so people, and people don't get much economic incentive. So they haven't learned to tolerate and live with the gorillas in the Eastern Lowlands, in the Eastern Lowland area, in um, the middle of DRC. Then you have the Western Lowland gorillas, and then you have the Cross River gorillas, which are sm smaller in number than the mountain gorilla. And all the gorillas are suffering from habitat loss. That's the big, one of the biggest threats. Um, another threat is poaching. In Uganda, people don't poach gorillas. Uh, because they don't eat gorillas. But in other part, countries in Africa, it's a delicacy. Some people think that if you eat a gorilla, you become as strong as a gorilla. So in those countries, they're at risk from the bushmeat trade. But also in Uganda, the, the issue of poaching comes because people want to eat animals which are found in a gorilla's habitat, like antelope, such as daika and bush pig. And when they eat this antelope, the gorillas get caught in snares set for these animals and can get very sick and die or they can get spear. Like, unfortunately, we lost a gorilla during COVID called Rafiki, who was heading a gorilla group called Nankuringo Gorilla Group. And he was about 25 years old, grown up all his life seeing tourists, almost all his life seeing them. And this person who was very hungry, poor member of the community came in to hunt animals for eating. So it wasn't the gorilla he was hunting, but the small antelope and the bush pig. Then when he saw the gorilla, he got scared and speared it and died and unfortunately the gorilla died and it was very 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 sad but that's also one of the big threats and then the, another threat is disease um disease is a very big threat when you habituate gorillas when you get them used to people and they're used to the presence of people disease becomes one of the biggest threats because we can pass on diseases to them um and also the moment you habituate them they'll go outside the park more often because they're now used to people and they'll get into trouble. They can get injured or they can destroy people's crops, but they can pick up diseases outside the park or inside the park from people who visit them. So, but when you habituate gorillas for tourism, they bring in money, which then protects them, which adds to their protection. So it's a very delicate balance between health and economics all the time. I mean, even before COVID-19 came about, we were always having those, having to make decisions regarding health and economics um, when it came to mountain gorillas. And so now with the COVID-19, those decisions have just intensified, I would say, maybe balancing furthermore on either side. But yeah, it's, it's always been like that with the gorillas. Like how much tourism can you allow that won't compromise them to the level that they'll get, you know, you end up destroying them because of too much tourism um, with all the stress and the health issues. But without the tourism, it's very difficult to protect them. So it's just finding that right balance. And I think I would say the way forward for that is responsible tourism. But because of those three main threats, threats habitat loss, poaching, disease, from closely related humans, gorillas are very threatened. But a lot of the things that make them even more threatened is the fact that the people who live next to gorillas, most of them are very poor, and there's a very high human population growth rate. So as we, that's why we've started to address encouraging people to adopt, you know, take contraception, do family planning. Um, not all, we don't tell them that because you have too many kids, you're going to destroy the gorilla's habitat. We say, if you have the children you can manage and you can afford, you can balance the family budget better. And that will help you in the long run to, to have a better life for you, your family and the gorillas will also be better off and you can benefit more when you have fewer children, even from the gorillas and the national parks. So it's just trying to 
the message is all about making it a win-win situation for the people and the animals. The connection between human uh, health and, and wildlife, uh, I, I think is kind of a, a higher level concept with that, you know, we learn in university and it's uh, sometimes hard to make the connection in your head. And I think that may be a silver lining of COVID as people are now recognizing that it can happen. It's not just a theoretical issue. Um, yes. and, and we're, you know, hopefully that, you know, leads into some better decision making. Um, uh, real quick, how are you guys doing with COVID? Are you guys staying safe? Well, we're trying our best to stay safe. Um, luckily in Uganda, we've had very few cases compared to the rest of the world. Um, gorilla tourism was shut down because of COVID-19. One, to protect the gorillas from getting sick and also because even to protect people from getting sick. You know, to basically movements were stopped at the end of March just to prevent only essential travel was allowed to minimize spread of the disease. And then later on, it was also like primary tourism stopped. It hasn't reopened yet, but other tourist areas have opened. So we haven't done enough testing. And I think that's why I'm a bit cautious about opening up like for primary tourism or opening up schools, opening up churches. They still wanna get a better handle of how everything is. So we're we've taken the cautious approach in Uganda which has helped us a lot because we don't have the hospitals that you have in America to have lots of people, you know, to accommodate lots of people, ICU. And yet even in America, you've also been overwhelmed. So it's a very scary situation. We'll overcome it. But one thing I can say about COVID is that it's made people understand what conservation through public health is doing and has been trying to do over the years. I mean, we've had people saying, now we understand what you're trying to do. <laughs> before they used to think, why are they going into all this and all that, you know? Now suddenly they're like, ah, this is why you're doing zoonosis, you know? And so as a result, I've been actually asked to speak on very many panels and meetings because we're doing what, we started doing what people were doing now, like 17 years ago when we started CTPH. So now they're like, oh, okay, tell us about this. What's your experience in this area? So it's making people understand better what we're trying to do, which is good because before people used to think disease wasn't a big threat for conservation, but now they're realizing that it is not only because it can affect the great apes, but it's also affecting the economy. And without the tourists coming in, you can't protect the wildlife because people, the poaching is going up. Nobody, you know, the economic incentive is not there. So, it's, it's so in one way or another, disease has affected conservation. And even in the public health sector, people would sometimes say, um, oh yeah, zoonotic disease. It's just one of the things in public health. You know, diseases from animals, okay. But now they're like, oh, diseases from animals is a big thing, you know. This is why the whole world has come to a standstill, you know. <laughs> so in both ways, it's both the health sector and the conservation community everybody's seeing that zoonotic disease is very important and a one health approach is the way to address it, you know, where you have human animal ecosystem health together. It used to be funny if no one understood the word zoonosis, like you'd put it in a proposal and if, if I gave it to somebody to read, they'll say, you know, it's too complicated. You have to make it really simple. No one knows what zoonosis means. So then you'd have to simplify it and say diseases spreading between people and animals. They can either go from animals to people or people to animals. But now you, just, you say zoonosis, everyone knows what you're talking about. Like, you don't have to explain it anymore. <laughs> yeah, you said silver lining. <laughs> I have to say that with gorilla, with, with what was happening with COVID-19, we had a lot of issues of tourists getting too close to gorillas and wanting to touch a gorilla. And now with COVID-19, tourists are actually saying, we don't want to make gorillas sick. We're only going to book our permit as long as we are sure that we're not going to make them sick. And so now it's going to be a lot easier to, tell, to educate people about social distancing and wearing a mask when they visit the gorillas because they've already been doing it, you know, for quite some time. So now everyone's kind of, it's becoming the new norm. So everyone knows, oh, this, this is why you social distance and wear a mask. It's just making it a lot easier for us to educate the tourists and everyone else who visits the gorillas. <laughs> Again, you guys are we're ahead of your time. So sticking with the, the community health aspect of your, of your organization, um, 
can you go a little bit more into it and I guess specifically, why is it important to empower local women uh, for the community health and for uh, wildlife conservation? Mm -hmm. um, it's important to empower local women because number one, they're half, you know, like they, you're missing out half the population if you don't empower them. And they're the people who really build up the rural areas. Um, in our approach, we have like a village health and conservation teams who are community health workers who we train to do conservation work. And so these village health and conservation teams talk to people about health and conservation as, as well. And because health is an issue that's very important to women, and conservation is more of an issue that's been important to men, we find that we're able to have half our volunteers are men and half our women. They're all community volunteers. And they go out and they talk to people about why they should be healthy and hygienic. And they also talk about why they should do, have voluntary family planning to balance the family budget. And actually the voluntary family planning has liberated so many women in the community because they used to have babies every year. And then now they can take a few years off, not have to have babies every year. And in between they can start a business, they can you know, make sure that all their children who are there go to school do many different things. Um, so it's really helped a lot with, with all of that. Um, and by empowering the women, we find that we're empowering the girl child. They're more likely to educate their daughters when they've been liberated, you know, and when they're empowered. And so we found that through our program, we're creating many women leaders in the community, which is really, really important um, because a lot of women were not empowered at all. And also by empowering the women leaders, then people will be more encouraged to support their daughters to go to school and the community will develop much faster. So it's very important to empower the women. We've, we've talked about the, the three strategic programs of CTPH a little bit, the uh, wildlife conservation, community health, um, but the alternative livelihoods. Uh, what kind of alternative livelihoods are you uh, offering up um, and, and helping them uh, uh, push forward? The type of alternative livelihoods, well, one of the main one we're pushing right now is Gorilla Conservation Coffee. And this was an idea actually of Florence, my husband. He, we saw that coffee farmers were not being engaged because every time you're going to trap gorillas, you cross coffee farms. And we found that they were not getting a fair price for their coffee. And not all of them were benefiting from the tourism industry because not everybody can be a ranger or a porter or sell their crafts or accommodation or food. Like, and they were not getting, being part of the tourism industry and yet they were not getting a good price for their coffee. And this was still driving them into the park to poach for diker, bush pig, collect firewood just because they wanted to earn a living. And so we thought that why not create a global brand that can save gorillas one step at a time by empowering these very farmers who, if they get a good price for their coffee, they won't have to enter the park to poach. And also coffee is, an, is a, something they've been doing for decades. And they have the expertise, but they don't have the market. So we thought it's very important to get a market for them. And actually we thought that originally most of the market would be from people outside Uganda, living outside Uganda and based outside Uganda, but actually a lot of the market has been within Uganda from tourists who come to visit the gorillas and they want to give back to the community. Sometimes these tourists cross coffee farms as they're tracking and the ranger guide will say, this is a coffee farm, this is how coffee looks. And so we thought that we need to support the farmers. And then a donation from every bag sold goes back to support the work of CTPH. And the rest of it, um, CTPH is a support now in the package here. And it's, we named the package after my favorite gorilla, Kanyoni, <laughs> who I've known since he was a baby. We named our very first coffee after Kanyoni, our first coffee, coffee blend. We didn't call it a blend, but our first coffee was named after Kanyoni, which is pure Arabica. And so, yeah, we decided to help them. And luckily enough, because it's a high, very good soils, the coffee is really good coffee. And we were not so sure how good it was, but we thought it was important to support the farmers. And we were very, very excited when we got our 92 points on Coffee Review, um, which was done by 
coffee review in California and we found out that we were in the top 30 coffees in the world that they sampled in 2018 and we got 92 points. So we're very excited about that. And now we're trying to get all the farmers to get up to that level so that we can find them a very good market. But actually during COVID-19, during COVID we found that there are no tourists, so no one's buying the coffee. But we've been able to get a buyer in the UK who has placed two orders since the coffee, since the pandemic began. So in May, she placed an order, she ran out of coffee. Then in June, she placed another order. And that's helping us to still be able to buy coffee from the farmers. We also have a distributor in America, um, pangos.com. But unfortunately, they sold out of coffee when the pandemic began. At the end of March, they had sold out. And they're waiting for the next cargo planes that can travel to America to place a big order because now they have many outstanding orders. But the more and more people we can get like that, the more that we'll be able to keep the farmers going and keep them outside the park which is really important, especially now during the pandemic when there are no tourists coming into Windy to see the gorillas. And so you guys have a, a cafe, I, I think I saw, is it in the capital? Yes, yes, we have a gorilla conservation cafe in Entebbe and we're able to, people are able to taste the coffee and tell us what they think. And so it's really nice to be able to meet people and to build a community around our brand. And also we're getting Ugandans to drink coffee. You know, Uganda is the largest, it's the largest coffee exporting country in Africa. We export the largest amount of coffee, but very few people drink coffee. <laughs> so they think it's coffee, it's a drink from someone else. And so the Uganda government is trying to get more Ugandans to drink coffee, but through our cafe, more and more Ugandans are drinking it because our baristas explain to them the difference between a latte, a cappuccino. And they're like, oh, this is really good. And People, are, we have seen more Ugandans drinking it. We have expatriates who come there and drink it. We also have, um, you know, tourists stop by on their way to the airport, on their way from the airport. So it's a, a nice way of getting people to learn about our coffee. And we're very happy to actually be able to visit Handover Roadsters in Santa Barbara when we came to Santa Barbara for University of California, Santa Barbara, to do some work with some of the professors there. Dr. Sana Sokolo who was also attached to Stanford University. And she came with a group of people and then they said, we need to see what we can do about gorilla, helping gorilla conservation coffee. Let's talk to a roaster in Santa Barbara. And so we went over and visited and it was really nice. <laughs> Where else can you connect uh, a family from Uganda to uh, local roasters in Santa, Santa Barbara? They, you know, it's it hard to recognize the the impact that just a, you know, a hot brown drink can have. And so it's really cool. <laughs> um, yes, coffee know. really connects communities. It really does. It's amazing. <laughs> it, it does. And I think it's, it's so ingenious and, and uh, I can, I'm losing my words here, but how cool it is to see that just because people like to wake up with a cup of coffee, we're saving gorillas at the same time. <laughs> Yes, we, it's just simple. I mean, a lot of people maybe may never make it out to Uganda because, you know, the cost is high or whatever reason. But at least if they're able to drink the coffee wherever they are around the world, they're also saving gorillas just by drinking, buying the coffee and drinking it. They're helping to save gorillas. So it's a nice way for people to be able to give back, um, a simple way for people to be able to give back. And a donation from every bag sold goes to support the work of CTPH to improve the health of the local communities where the farmers are found, the health of the gorillas and the conservation education around the park. So it's more another way to sustain conservation beyond only tourism, which especially in the pandemic we're seeing, we can't just rely on tourism. You know, when there's an infectious pandemic like highly contagious pandemic like COVID-19 and tourists can't travel, nobody can travel, at least the farmers can still be supported by people in America, UK and other countries by who could buy the coffee and save gorillas one sip at a time. <laughs> I like that, I like that. Where uh, in normal times could someone buy the coffee? Can you give uh, some websites, some um, distributors that we could look for? Yes, you can buy the coffee from uh, www.pangos.com um, and also from there he has an online shop and then if you happen to be in Portland, Maine, you can also get it from Arabica Coffee House in 
Portland, Maine. And on our website, we have www.gccoffee.org, which has all the places you can buy it. And in the UK, you can buy it from manurobeans.com. And New Zealand, gorillacoffee.nz. Yep. And in South Africa, from Kariko Cafe. So on our website, we have the different places where you can buy the coffee and where you can find it. <laughs> In terms of your organization and the, the Gorilla Conservation Coffee, what are, where are you looking to go with it? Would you have lo- like longer term goals? Um, or where are, you, are you trying to expand like outside of Uganda or are you just trying to make uh, what you have as good as it can be? Um, a combination of both. <laughs> we're trying to make what we have as good as it can be. With, like, we see the work that we do in Uganda as like a testing site for anything new that's happening that we can take to other places and either we take it ourselves so other people can come and learn and adopt and take it as well. So in Buindi, we have a big office. We have like a a big Gorilla Health and Community Conservation Center built with support from Task Trust. And we generally carry out, you know, every month we analyze samples from every habituated gorilla group and every five years from the ones from the gorilla census as well. And we're looking at diseases that they have or they could be picking up from people or their animals, the livestock. And we do all kinds of things there. We also host students from around the world, Uganda and around the world. And then we do a lot of community work. So we want to, some of that, what we do there, we've taken to DRC. Um, We're working with local communities in the Burungas where the gorillas are found. And we have like village health and conservation teams, we're trying to compare, you know, do some gorilla health monitoring, compare what we found in the gorillas and the people there. And re- most recently with an award from the St. Andrew's Prize for the Environment, we won that in February, 2020. And uh, we traveled to Scotland for it and got back just in time. As soon as we got back to Uganda, there was a lot, they stopped, you know, COVID began in the UK, so we just missed it. <laughs> but uh, we were really pleased to win that award because they wanted us to, expand what we're doing with the Eastern lowland gorillas where the populations are going down and bring similar benefits to those communities. So we, we see ourselves um, sharing our lessons in places where gorillas are found all over Africa and trying to reverse the trend. Only the mountain gorilla population is the only one going, increasing in number. We want to reverse the trend of the other three subspecies which are decreasing in number and see if our approach can help them increase in number. And in, in that respect, we want to scale up the Gorilla Conservation Coffee as well, because a lot of these places don't have tourists and may never have tourists because they live in places where there's a lot of conflict, civil war, the road infrastructure is bad, but they have coffee farmers and it's at a high altitude and they can get money out of coffee. So we're trying to see how Gorilla Conservation Coffee model can go up, can also be scaled up along with the CTPH model in the gorilla habitats in Africa. And then also we are getting people to scale up what we're doing in other parts of Uganda, like the One Health model. So in Queen Elizabeth National Park, which is very near Windy, like a four hour drive, we are also looking at disease between the wildlife, like the buffalo, the cattle, the people, and trying to get the cattle keepers to support conservation by improving the health of their livestock and telling them how they shouldn't graze in the park and they shouldn't poach and so that they can benefit from wildlife conservation. So it's kind of like an adaptation of our model at Gwindi to other places. And other groups are trying to adopt that model wherever they work with other species. So we're just trying to, um, we've made a decision that we're gonna focus more on the gorilla protected areas, but we can, we're still able to scale up our model in other protected areas, working closely with the local partners. Cause we still think it's relevant for, to save savanna species, to save, other kind of animals as well, not only the gorillas. So for example, the Jengu Institute in Uganda have scaled up our approach to protect chimpanzees in Budongo Forest. And, you know, we, we, anyone, we are quite happy to share what we're doing because we would like to use our model to have benefits for many people all over the world. Um, but we are focusing more on the gorilla subspecies because we feel that that's where we can make the biggest difference. We kind of already mentioned with with COVID. I, I hope that that um, that barrier that you guys faced as you were building your organization and trying to you know get these ideas out there um, will 
be taken down because everyone understands now what exactly that could mean if things do, don't go well. Yes. Yeah, hopefully that's the silver lining we found with COVID. Um, it's kept us super busy. Um, it's difficult for us to sit back when we can do something about it. And yeah, so like, for example, the communities around Windy, we're now trying to get them fast growing seedlings because they're hungry. Um, they have no money to buy food because they're no tourists. And they used to farm before tourism came along. So we're trying to get them back to the traditional methods that they, they had, you know, their ancestors had. And, but doing it in a better way, a more sustainable way, using, you know, proper soil and water conservation, proper sustainable agriculture techniques so that they always have food. Even when tourism comes back, instead of spending the tourism money to buy food, they can spend it for other things, like developing their communities, taking their kids to school and other things. So we were, we were talking about it and the Uganda Wildlife Authority is very happy that we want to start offering them seedlings. They think that it's great because it's, it's something that can last long beyond even COVID. It will always be beneficial for them to have balanced diet, you know, vegetables, all the right kind of vegetables and food in their garden. And that's already a good thing because it means that the children will eat well, they'll eat well, as, and the money they get from tourism or anything else goes to other things. So we're just trying to push that as well. It's something we never thought about, but we found that it was the only way to help in this situation because it's pretty desperate. <laughs> yeah. The one question that we ask every person we talk to um, is, is sometimes difficult, sometimes really easy. It just depends. Um, what is it that gives you hope? Uh, and as we all on this call understand uh, how easy it is to lose hope in this field. Oh, hi, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe it's your children. What is it that gives you hope? Because it's so easy to, to, to lose hope in this field and it's so important to keep it. So what is it that gets you up in the morning? What is it that makes you uh, feel good about uh, moving forward with this? Yes, it's really easy to get disappointed and to lose hope. But I think a lot of what gives me hope is, you know, I'm inspired, as you said, by the next generation, my sons. Um, our sons, um, they've been going to the park since they were very little. And so I'm really inspired by that. Um, I'm inspired by whenever we make a difference in our programs, like the gorilla numbers going up, you know, new babies being born, like people appreciating the gorillas much more. People would have originally hunted them and now saying, I actually want to visit them as tourists. And those kind of things give me hope when the local community starts to really appreciate the gorillas. We are happy that the gorillas are falling sick less often because of our approach. And this has also helped to contribute to the numbers going up. So those kind of things, the success stories give me hope and make me feel like it's worth doing what we're doing. Um, and when people around get to understand the importance of gorillas, you know, at whatever level, could be decision policymakers, people right up to the top, when they say that they want to protect the gorillas and the chimpanzees and other wildlife, that, that gives me a lot of hope. And I'm very lucky that my mom is an extremely um, supportive mom. She lets us do what we want. And so she's very, really been um, supporting me ever since I was little. You know, like the fact that I liked animals, she would take, you know, make sure that I followed the path that I wanted to take, which is great. Um, yeah, our parents have given us a lot of hope. Yeah. And, my, and I'm glad to have a very supportive husband as well because he's the founder member of CTPH. Gorilla Conservation Coffee, and it's something that we build together. And our children, like, are so happy to take our 15-year-old son gorilla tracking for the first time in his life in March. And you're not allowed to track gorillas until you're 15 years old because of diseases. Mm -hmm. And so everyone wondered. He hasn't tracked. I said, no, he's not yet 15. And he's been going there since he was four months old. And now when we took him tracking, that was just amazing. He really enjoyed it. He was just like, you're always talking about the gorillas. Now I'm finally seeing them. So the rangers really clapped and everybody was so excited when he got his certificate. <laughs> Great. You have a, a, a new cadre of gorilla biologists coming up. Yes. Yes, we do. Yeah, they both love animals and football after their dad. <laughs> <laughs> so they make friends with the children in the community. Actually, we also started a kids league. Um, where we teach the kids to learn what we're doing through sports. So they play 
soccer together on netball. And the boys really love soccer. So they always like playing with the children in windy soccer. They have lots of friends there, <laughs> soccer mates. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are and, and uh, with all the great things you're doing. So thank you again. And we're, I can't tell you how much we're looking forward to coming out and meeting you and your family and, and seeing the gorillas and the whole, whole thing. So uh, hopefully we can figure that out here in the next year or two. Just, you know, hopefully we'll be able to travel in the next year or two. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully when the vaccine comes out. <laughs> Yeah, it would be so nice to see you both in Uganda. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, we would love it. So. And um, yeah, so it would be great if people can visit our website. We are 501c3 organization, so people can donate and get a tax deduction. So spread awareness about our work, visit us. Yeah, all of that is really important to keep things going. <laughs> <laughs> and buy Gorilla Conservation Coffee. <laughs> no, it's fun to say bye. Yeah. Okay, guys. So thanks for your time as well. <laughs> nice to meet you again. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Yay, later, man. Bye. <laughs> Thank you again to Dr. Gladys and her husband Lawrence for talking to us. And please visit Conservation Through Public Health's website at ctph.org and Gorilla Conservation Coffee at gorillaconservationcoffee.org and please consider donating. In a time like COVID-19, the communities are lacking the tourism dollars they usually get and it could really use your help. All of our podcasts can be found at our website at pelicanus.org, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Podcasts. Now don't forget to like and subscribe to our page before you go, and we look forward to bringing you more inspiring stories. Thank you again for watching.